Many of us have experienced traumas over the last several years with the pandemic. Multiple traumas, compounding traumas, traumas in our family systems. How do we live our best life with all of these traumas and learn how to not just survive, but actually thrive through those traumas? Today's guest, Haley Adams, is going to talk to us about the work that she does with first line responders and with other people who have experienced trauma to help them get unstuck and go from surviving to thriving. Have a listen and find out more. Soul Nectar Show. The Soul Nectar Show. You're invited, delighted to discover who. If you believe to join us on this beautiful journey, so let us show. Before we start this episode, I, Carrie Hummingbird, and I, Akeem Sami, want you to know that you are invited. You're invited to, to join, join Soul Nectar, Nectar Tribe. Tribe. If you like what you hear on Soul Nectar Show, you will love being in person with us in Soul Nectar Tribe. We invite you to check it out. First 30 days is free. Right now, go to carryhummingbird.com, K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com, forward slash membership, and sign up. We'll We'll see see you you at our our next tribe tribe gathering. gathering. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our connection to that which is bigger than us, to the great mystery beyond the veil and into our very bodies where we feel all the feels and we have all the thoughts and all the sensations and we're swimming in a sea of other humanity that's also feeling all the feels and and thinking all the things and rushing around and whatever else is happening. And it's kind of a little bit chaotic in 2022 up until now. And we are being called forth to another whole way of being in New Earth. And that's what we're here to explore. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird. And you know that I'm here for the Great Awakening. I am here for New Earth. I am here for dismantling the stuff that don't work and just letting spirit guide us into the evolution of what is going to work so much better for so many more people on this planet. As I was coming into this episode today with the beautiful Haley, I what was coming up in my heart was really arising for me was this idea that so many of us don't understand that we're one human family, that we are we are one human family family. We're all connected. And what happens to my brother and my sister happens to me. What happens to the untouchables happens to me. What happens to the wealthiest people happens to me because we're all connected. It can't be any other way. And I feel like in this time when we're, you know, so many people in the world are afraid of each other and are, um, you know, wearing masks and social distancing and and avoiding and and running away from each other and then you know the looming threat of war and all of these things it boils down to like a sense of separation and insecurity and like not realizing that we're one human family what affects one of us affects all of us and beyond that we're we're part of one ecosystem on the planet that is all connected and the plants and the animals and the soil and the waters, the oceans, the mountains, whatever happens to our relations that are maybe not human, but are definitely present and sustaining us on this planet, what happens to them happens to us too. And, you know, this is all begging the question, how can we come into realization of that out of the dream or I could say the nightmare of separation and anxiety and stress and trauma and, and, you know, depression and all those labels, you know, all those ways that we could feel as super difficult, like where we feel like life is a, is a struggle and we suffer. 
So we're here today with, with Haley Adams, who is a retired combat veteran, a tra trauma mental health therapist and coach, and an aspiring author. She is a trauma therapist and coach. She works with neuroscience-based modalities using the body, habits, mindset, and grounding skills to help those with trauma become unstuck and go from surviving to thriving. And Haley hosts the Tra Magili, Mag Tra Magility <laughs> podcast <laughs> about healing trauma. And I've actually been on that podcast. I'm super excited to share that episode with you all as well in the show notes. Just really enjoyed our conversation there. Um, and she also does a podcast, Frontline Strong, dedicated to first responders who also go through trauma as they're helping other people go through trauma. And how can we do this with grace, love, and open hearts and compassion? That is, I know, on, on Haley's heart on a daily basis. Um, welcome to the show, Haley. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks for having me. So glad you're here. You're just like a breath of fresh air. Share with us how you got started in your understanding of trauma and then and then lead us forward because I know we were talking before the show and you've you've made a lot of realizations about trauma and I and I would love the audience to hear these realizations because many of the people that listen to this show are light workers and healers and therapists themselves and they could benefit from your wisdom. Yeah. So my story starts at birth actually. Um, I had 19 different traumas before I was 17 years old, um, including I was in the Northridge earthquake in California. Um, I had lost my home to a fire shortly after that. I had moved um, to Utah. I had a disability. I had Tourette syndrome and divorce and, and crazy, crazy, crazy things happened um, throughout my life. And so I was addicted to this chaos of trauma and I joined the military at 17 years old and I wanted to serve. I didn't know what I wanted to do necessarily. I knew I didn't want to go to college, which I ended up <laughs> doing like eight years of college anyway, but I went to, um, to join and I just found a love for service. And I really found myself going all around the world. And you had mentioned the mountains and um, in Utah, there's the Rockies. And I spent a lot of time um, up in the Rockies and just kind of self-reflecting on things. And then I decided when I came off of active duty that I really wanted to be a therapist, um, helping other people heal. Because when I joined the military, I then went to war. I went to, um, Iraq and experienced a lot of things that were very new to me. Cause I, I kind of lived as much as my trauma um, you know, showed up in my life, I kind of lived a shelter life because you didn't talk about it. And my mom, um, I love her to death, but she is a narcissist and she's an alcoholic. And so everything was, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Me, 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 me. So I came into the, the realization that I was built to serve, but no one was serving me. Like I, I wasn't serving me. Um, and I didn't allow anybody to. And so I went on this huge journey after being um, in, a, in a VA mental health uh, inpatient unit, but I call it the psych ward. It was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely a psych ward. Um, I found myself in there and I was like, this can't be the end of my story. This, this has to change. Um, so I went down to the Utah desert in Southern Utah and just spent an entire summer there. My kids stayed with their dad and my, um, their grandparents, my parents. And I just went on this huge spiritual journey and I was put on, um, I went through all kinds of antidepressants through the VA. I cycled through all the medications and nothing was working. So I was like, okay, so it can't be anything that is, you know, chemical in the parts of the brain that these types of medicines are, are targeting. It has to be something else. It has to be something different. Um, and at this time I was already finished with my master's. And so I went into the field of study of trauma and then eventually into alternative medicine and addictions. 
And I found that trauma is not just one diagnosis in the DSM of PTSD. Trauma is all encompassing. Trauma can look like a million different things. It can look like ADHD, OCD, DID, bipolar. A lot of my clients come to me and they're like, yeah, I've been diagnosed bipolar. I was like, is it really bipolar or is it just trauma? And so I work with the body um, and I work with neuroscience based principles and a, like a touch of spirituality in there too. Um, and I work mind, body, spirit to get the individual healed by um, integrating all of their parts. I love everything you just said. It's so powerful. This was my journey as well. And I think you know that, um, you know, I, I was told for decades that I was either bipolar or manic depressive, and then it became borderline personality disorder. And that was, you know, the shame I felt of that was so extreme. And I, it kind of sent me off down a rabbit hole of even worse behavior, right? Because then I felt like, well, I can't help myself. So I guess I can do whatever I want. And then I ended up destroying some more of my relationships in the process. And, um, and then I walked away from all that. And when I found my spiritual path, one of my guides also, my first teacher said he thought it was all trauma. And he thought you could do, you know, healing, like shamanic healing on that to restore the earliest traumas, like heal the original wound. They talk about the original wound and shamanic healing as like when you get to the original wound, the first place that the pain started and you heal that, then everything ripples forward from that moment because all the other things were just repetitions of that original trauma. Is that also what you see when you work with people? Funny enough, that's actually my model and I use it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I use it and I, and I liken it to a weed in a garden. And if you cut off the top of the weed with all these different issues, all these different, um, you know, stems, it's going to grow back and maybe even bigger the next time. So you really have to rip out the root of the issue of the core issue. And typically a lot of these core issues are from childhood because we know uh, scientifically that the first years of life, like one through five are really the most important, um, in development. And those are the years that are forgotten, but our bodies remember because our cells store those memories. And so I'll get clients in, in my office and they're like, well, I mean, I feel this way, but nothing happened to me. I had a great childhood. Like my parents were great. Uh, I had a great education and, you know, I, I played sports <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but you're rocking back and forth, which tells me that that's a very cerebral function. So what happened to you when you were really little? And so we go down to the nonverbals because those memories mm -hmm. are nonverbal and you can't express them in language because it's a different language. And so I help them find their language um, that works best for them. So if they were sexually assaulted, their language could be sex. And a lot of that healing and that processing and that trauma and that, that communication that they're trying to do, that control that they're trying to get back is expressed through sexual things. That's so powerful because I swear I, you're speaking words that have come out of my mouth. <laughs> it's like, I love everything you're saying. I'm like, I'm looking at him going, Haley got a lot of the same downloads. I mean, mm -hmm. I started realizing in my own journey about how it was these early childhood um, moments of, tr of PTSD. I, I went through a lot of trauma, you know, from zero to five. And I was like, oh, well, you know, okay, five-year-olds have a very limited vocabulary. Three-year-olds have an even more limited vocabulary. Two-year-olds don't have, and one-year-olds and a baby, they don't have words. In the womb, there's no words for that. So if, if my trauma was in the womb because my mom didn't want to have me, for example, and was afraid to have a baby, like right from the moment she found out she was pregnant, and then that fear that she had and the anxiety that she had continued, my, my consciousness picked up all of that. Yeah. But it's at, it's at a different level of consciousness than, than the consciousness of words. So sitting in psychotherapy is not going to solve it because... It, that can't even touch the level uh, that's operating the program. Mm -hmm. 
because it's yeah. below words. Right, right. And it's completely different. You're speaking Japanese versus German. Okay. And don't, okay, so now I also feel like we have to model, like, I know you do a lot of inner child healing mm -hmm. because that's important for this. I mean, you've, I've experienced that inner child healing is like, is mostly what's going on and it's nonverbal, most of it. So it's what? It's frequency, right? It's like, it's remothering, reparenting. So talk about that. Oh, goodness. I could talk so for juicy. hours about this. <laughs> Okay, so vibrations are a thing. Mirror neurons are a thing. Pheromones are a thing. And here's a, here's a really important fact that not a lot of people know. Trauma doesn't just start in the womb. Trauma starts generations before you. And trauma changes your DNA code. And the DNA gets passed down from mother to child, mother to child, mother to child. And that gets affected by it. So you're not only dealing with your trauma, you're dealing with generations before you of trauma that you may not even be aware of, which is a third language. And so you have to go to the body. You have to go to the vibrations of what you feel. You have to go to being aware of, okay, can you feel your toes? Can you feel your fingers? No? Well, then you're not really in your body. You're outside of your body. Your soul is not resonating with your body. And here's a fun fact about death. When people die, their vibrations go from their toes all the way up to their heart and it stays in the heart. And when a person dies, it goes through the crown of their head each time. So as our soul leaves their body, it leaves your extremities. If you can't feel your extremities, that is shame. That is guilt. And it's resonating on a scale. Shame is about 20. Death is zero. Love is a thousand. And so you're literally killing yourself. You're dying. If you're not present in the moment, feeling all of the feelings, not just the good ones, not just the bad ones. But if you shut yourself off to the bad ones, you're also shutting yourself off to the good ones as well. Yeah, it's powerful. And, you know, it has to be safe in order to feel all the feels. Mm -hmm. because. There's like layers and layers of healing and they all happen because the first, like the onion, you peel off the, the fat, thick layer of the onion, all of a sudden you, you just went up like, you know, 10 degrees mm -hmm. <laughs> in your vibration, right? And you're like, oh, this is great. Oh my gosh, this is so much better than before. So I'm happy. It's like, mm, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> What's, deeper? What's deeper? Yeah. And you go to the next level deeper, it gets more... You know, this is the part of the transformation journey that people have a hard time with, um, is that as you go deeper, it get it does feel more intense because you can feel. Yes. And then you realize, oh, I wasn't feeling, I wasn't, my awareness wasn't in these places before, but I'm carrying all of this pain around. Mm -hmm. But my awareness was outside of this, so I just tuned it out or suppressed it or blocked it. But it doesn't, but it was in my field generating my little attractor all the time to call into being everything I need to call the situations to provoke me into healing this thing that's under the surface that I won't look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many clients do you have that come in and say, oh, everything's fine? And then after about 10 minutes of your vibration with them and your, your safety and your love and your opening, they start to open and feel and all of a sudden this huge thing came out that they forgot about that's actually like an amazingly big deal to talk about. Like how often does that have for you? I would say like 100% of the time. <laughs> yeah. 100% of the time because they, they try and minimize and be like, yeah, like I have this little issue, but I've been managing it like X, Y, and Z. But when we get down to it, it's like a huge issue. It's a huge issue. And, and it's like an, an onion of the layer. And, and the layers just go down to one very specific thing that I've seen. And it always starts with an I am. Ah, uh, an agreement. An I am. An agreement. I love the four agreements. Um, and it's an I am statement that is typically negative. 
with a trauma. I am not good enough. And it's typically vague. It's very vague. It's not specific. Um, and so it encompasses all of, of your being. But when it does that, your magnetic field shrinks for one. And you also attract the negative thing. So with my, um, with my domestic violence clients, um, and this has been a lifelong journey <laughs> with myself as well, is I have a string of abusive relationships. But when we have a domestic violence in our lives, we often come up with this narrative of, well, my toxic exes, and I've got like nine of them okay, but what's the common denominator? Like what is continuing to attract them to you? And mm -hmm. it's you, it's, it's something within you that is attracting them to you. And typically it's a lack of boundaries. It's that servitude. It's that, um, that learned helplessness that I must serve to be a good person. And that's typically learned in childhood. Yeah, pa ancestral patterns that are passed down. And then all you're doing is when you go out and start dating is your your attractor field and your gene keys, by the way, I, I love the gene keys. Your gene, your, it's attracting you to the same pattern in somebody else's family line. Mm. And then, right? Because both of y'all need to heal that thing, so. Absolutely. It's funny because people will say, well, my parents were alcoholics, so I never touched alcohol. And I was like, really, how many friends do you have that are alcoholics? What about coworkers? What about like other relationships in your life? And they'll be like, oh, all of them. I was like, yeah, because it feels normal. It feels comfortable. It feels safe. It feels familiar to you. And human beings, we're tribes. We love our communities. We love to connect with somebody. And if we're not, that means we are isolating and exiling ourselves out of the tribe to die because of the shame, because of the, the guilt, because of those negative um, feelings that we, were, that we were talking about. But within our tribe, we tend to love to find the tribe that feels the most familiar. And that's why breaking trauma sometimes is so hard to do is because, but I've been in this pattern for all my life and this is what it feels like. But I'm like, but once you raise above the tornado of the, like into the clouds and, and really take a look around, you'll be like, Oh, <laughs> I see. Yeah, that is so accurate. That reminds me of that moment in the Matrix where Neo and Trinity are headed to Machine City. And then they have this moment of like rising above the clouds and seeing the sun for the first time. And then going, wow, it exists. And then, you know, it's like that, you know. And I feel like for uh, when I get into these moments of, um, um, let's say I have like a breakthrough moment and I feel this joy come through my body that like I have only maybe felt a handful of times in my life, right? They're just like recently just had these like huge moments of bliss, you know? And then in the days following, I'll notice a contraction. And I'm like, oh, so like part of me is like, oh, that's not normal. That's not, that's not my reality that I know. That's not. And so then I know I got to go in and do that work, right? It's like, Oh, there's something down in there that's not that even though this feels so much better, there's some piece of me clinging to this this old modality because that was what was normal. Like it was normal to have, you know, Metallica raging in my brain, right? From the trauma. Like that was normal. So when I start listening to, you know, Solfreggio frequencies and calming, soothing ocean music, some part of me is very uncomfortable. Mm. And it's almost like the yoga saying that those who resist against it need it the most. That's exactly what it is because in science terms, your nervous system is so activated in trauma and it continues to be activated as long as you keep it alive and your system, your sympathetic nervous system is the one that has fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and it's with the limbic system and there, we've got a couple different systems, but just to kind of simplify it, um, your system when activated doesn't go to rest unless you put it there or your environment puts it there. And this is where consciousness comes in. And this is, a, this is what awareness and consciousness are all about in this transformation work. Right. And so until you start to make that shift 
from system to system because it's almost going from a different fuel source and you're shifting from one fuel source to another within your body. And so you go to your rest and digest and that's where you feel you're calm. But if you go into too much, that's where the depression comes in and the numbing. So it's a healthy balance between the two. Yeah. And there's no like static experience, you know, and it's like there's a range of life and we have to be willing to experience the entire range mm -hmm. and then also practice bringing the mastery of, of experiencing the whole range, like, you know, the highest high to the lowest low, and then the mastery to, to live in the middle of that, like to bring it into center. But that's, you know, that's like, um, you always got to brush your teeth, right? I mean, <laughs> you eat food, your teeth get dirty, you got to brush them again. So like this is the same thing, like there's no like, okay, I've arrived, now I'm only in bliss or I'm only in peace or I'm only in balance. No, because life is going around like all over the place. <laughs> right. And the amount of joy that you feel is directly proportionate to the amount of pain that you felt. So if you don't live on a full spectrum, then you're not really living at all. Wow, that's okay. I'm, let's just pause on that one for a second. The amount of joy you're able to experience is directly correlated to the amount of pain that you also experienced. Yeah. And I experienced a ton of pain in my life. Yeah. And so now in order to be an I need and right relationship, it's to allow myself to experience that amount of joy. And you can, because the threshold grows. As pain grows or deepens, joy heightens. And so a lot of people, what I've noticed, I think people know this, but what I've noticed that, um, like even some spiritual teachers say, is their solution is to just go to total neutrality mm -hmm. and not feel this and not feel this. And I'm kind of feeling like, well, then why are you, why are you in a body? Like, why come to earth? and be a human being if you don't want to experience the highest joy and you don't want to experience the greatest deepest longing or pain or because you love someone so much like that's a very human experience to love that deeply that it's almost like painful in some ways when you love someone that much but yet it's also like this incredible experience to love somebody that much and because of mirror neurons, you can now empathize with people who have been in the exact same situation that you have and connect even deeper and be able to sit with them and not get scared. And that's how we expand our capacity to be present with everyone's experiences on the planet today who have inherited some pretty traumatic things in human history. Yeah. All over the yeah. planet, people have experienced some extremely traumatic things in human history. Mm -hmm. Now I'll tell you where neutrality works. And that's like with mindfulness in the moment when you do need to ground yourself, when you do need to come from down from an activated state to a more peaceful state, because if you don't, if you don't create that safety with you, because in trauma, that's all that you're doing to heal is create a safe space, a safe bubble for you to feel what you feel, validate your feelings as real and that they are true, but they are not necessarily reality as we know it, right? Because what is reality? No one could say, right, Alan Watts? Because reality isn't in words. So when we take our feelings and we validate them and we sit with them and we do that reparenting and be like, okay, so my brat, I call it my brat, my brat is really activated right now. She's throwing a tantrum. And what age do I feel like? Well, I feel like I'm nine. Okay. I'm going to talk to that little nine-year-old within me. Okay. All right. So what do you, what do you need? Let me hear you. Let me sit with you. Let me be with you. Just talk to me. Like, what is it that you're afraid of? What is it that you're angry of? And what is it that you're confused about? Like, I will answer any questions that you have. And it's almost like having a, a group therapy session with your different <laughs> parts and just talking. <laughs> the round table of, of me's. 
Yeah, <laughs> the round table of peace. And I, I use passengers on a bus or people at your table, right? Um, and I use two different scenarios for, for different things. But if, if we're using the table analogy, like who is at your table? Who is talking the loudest? You, you've all been to like those family functions or dysfunctions, as I like to call them, where, you know, the uncle's crazy and the mom's like yelling at the dad. And well, who is at your table and what does that look like? And so at my table, I had my mother. I had um, some of the girls from school that would make fun of me. And um, I would have like a really good mentor, like one of the, the teachers that I'll, that I'll just love forever. Um, and different people come and go throughout your life and sit down at your table, but it's up to you to control it because you're at the head of the table. Your authentic self as you are now, your higher self, your higher being, will sit at the, at the head of the table and be like, okay, so you're a little too loud, like you need to leave the party. Yeah. Well, you know, little children, like as a mom, I think being a mom helps with this because we have direct experience of parenting actual children. You know, I yeah. mean, like I say, children bodies that are outside of us. And mm -hmm. so we get this opportunity to, to guide and nurture and be responsible for these external beings that are in bodies walking around and we have to be present for moments where they start screaming in the super in the supermarket you know and you're like looking around like everyone's wanting me to make this stop and i can't or like the time i had my youngest my older son on the the little tiny plane in between islands in hawaii and he decided that that was the best time to start screaming <laughs> on a little tiny no. plane but everyone no. wanted me to make it stop and I'm like I can't what am I what do you want me to smother him I mean what do you he's gonna you know I can't Benadryl. <laughs> I mean not that I did would make this kid happy like in that moment he just he didn't like the plane he didn't like the altitude or whatever it was going on for him it freaked him out so anyway so I mean things like that we have to deal with those things in the moment and then that but see like all I realized like all of that on the outside was also what I needed to be doing on the inside. It's just that I had to come to the realization that all of that was going on inside of me on the inside. It's just that I had this false idea that I was one solid being with one brain and one heart and one body. And that was just one of me going on. And that was the biggest lie ever. And I think that's what DID people show us, right? Like there's a great show like, um, the United States of Terra. I've never seen that. No. Oh my gosh, it's on um, Showtime, I think, or something like that. Anyway, it was this TV series a dozen years ago, and it was a, it was actually about um, this multiple personality woman and how her family just like grew up with her, you know, her kids and everything just had to deal with like she had multiple personalities that would come out. They would dress different, they would talk different, mm -hmm. and you know, they just like, oh, this is Alice. Okay, Alice is here. Welcome, Alice. Hi, Alice. Like they just got used to like it wasn't one mom. It was like all these beings inside their mom, which I think would be very stressful. But you know, it's like we all have that. That's actually the truth. We all have that going on inside of us. It. Just that it's really seamless. We shift in and out of these aspects all the time. So it's important to learn, like you're talking about, how to figure out like who's, you know, sit at your table and, and how do you figure out who's like all upset right now or what's going on inside? I love that you bring up DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. Um, I'm going to get a lot of backlash from my community about this, but I honestly feel like it's a different level and intensity of trauma. And so I feel like depression and anxiety are first, right? And then it goes up to PTSD. Then it goes up to um, bipolar um, you know, schizophrenic, uh, affect, and then it goes up to DID. And I think that that is the most intense form of, of trauma that, that individuals don't understand, like how to deal with it and how to incorporate their parts that are coming out that they identify with, because a lot of these, these, um, these, well, I call them parts, but a lot of these multiple personalities are coming out. They're different ages. They, they have different names and one will be diabetic and the other will not be. And so medically it's an anomaly, but honestly, I'm just sitting here and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that makes total sense um, from a trauma standpoint under, under that umbrella. 
Well, it also reinforces the truth of spiritual principles that we've known about for quite a while, which is that you're creating your reality with what you believe and what is inside your field. And so if you've splintered off your personality into multiple aspects that all are experiencing different realities, then when one reality comes in that doesn't have cancer, and medically you test it, it doesn't have cancer, and then the next re and then the next aspect comes in that fully believes it does, and then all of a sudden it's got cancer. To me, that's proof that, hey, you know, we are all, are all creating our reality, which is why it's so important for us to do this inner, like, assessment process, like keep checking, keep being aware, like looking in and, and really revealing, like you said, those I am statements and like mm -hmm. healing those so we can experience a different reality. Your mind can cause cancer. Your mind can cause a shift in your cells for them to mutate. Because, I mean, I'll, I'll say it, 85%, 85% of medical illnesses are mental. And that's why you get these, these weird diagnoses like fibromyalgia, IBS, and people are like, well, I have no idea where that came from. I do. I do like what happened to you and how are you dealing with it? What stress level are you? Because if we look at cortisol that's released, that does, it wreaks havoc to your body. And if you're constantly in an activated state, that's a lot of damage that you're doing. Now, the good news is that in most cases it could be reversed, right? And people have healed themselves from cancer using the brain and meditation. And so you can heal. It's just learning the formula how to, and that's what I teach my clients. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that. I, so I, I concur. Yes, it's totally real. And that's kind of like when I saw this COVID thing come out, like, um, in 2019 or whatever it was in 2020, as it really started taking hold, I was, and I was watching the, I, I didn't, I don't watch the news, but I watched a little bit of it. And I, you know, I kind of watched some different shows and stuff. I actually just stopped watching all that stuff completely. Cause I was like, this is causing a mass hysteria. And not only is it causing a mass hysteria, it's causing um, like a fear story that everyone is believing and agreeing to. And because they're believing and agreeing to it, they're manifesting more of it as if it's true. And because they're doing that, they're all getting sick. And they're getting so sick, they're dying from it. It was like, we're just creating this whole thing as a collective. And I was like, I'm not... I'm not creating that anymore. I'm not part of that. Now I did, I, I did end up getting, I did actually get it, but I got it like this year, just like uh, beginning of the year in January, pretty much through the 22nd, I had it. And I, I thought back to myself, cause I was like, how did this happen? Cause I kept getting told I'm not gonna get it. I'm not gonna get it. It's not my thing, whatever. And I remembered back to this one moment, like a week before I got it, where I said, you know what? I would be okay with having that just so I could prove that I've had it so I don't have to get a vaccine. Yep. <laughs> there. <laughs> Bam. It showed up. I was like, you're kidding, right? Like I opened some little door and it just came right in, but I'm, I'm okay with it because I learned a lot from it during that, that three weeks. I was like, wow, I've learned a lot from this. Like I learned, I love to taste things and I love to smell things. And I learned that I need to rest and take care of my body and relax. I mean, this was a big medicine teacher for me. I really learned a lot from it, but it does go to show what you're saying about the mind and the power of the mind. It's just like with these labels, like this is also like getting back to the psychotherapy conversation. This is why I don't like these labels because I feel like diagnosing and labeling someone, my experience of that was that it made me identify as that and then mm -hmm. once I identified as that, there's all these support groups on Facebook and, and I, I go in there now and I look, cause I'm, I don't identify as that anymore, but I go and look and I'm like, I see everybody sort of creating like this sort of like um, support to keep staying in the same dynamic. Like, and if you try to put anything in there to disrupt it or to offer another, a healing or a way to be, through that experience and to the other side, they don't post it. That's why in addictions, I learned this when I worked in rehabs and when clients come to me and they say, oh, I'm an alcoholic. No, you're not. You have alcoholism. I'm bipolar. No, you are not. You are not your bipolar diagnosis. And because the brain registers 
and your soul, your body, like your mind, all of it registers. I am as identity. It goes straight through all the barriers directly into your soul. And so that's why I say very first session, watch your I am's, watch your shoulds. Shoulds are expectations that we place on ourselves or others that if not met leads to resentments and resentment leads to the self-deprecating and goes back to a negative I am. And so it all spirals around that I am because that's shame if it's negative. And so it needs to be a more true statement, a more true statement to you. So I'm not good enough at what? Okay. So you feel that way. I feel not good enough, but at what? Well, obviously five foot two female, I'm not going to be in the NBA, (laughs) right? So I know that I am not qualified to be in the NBA, but that does not mean I am not good enough. I feel like I'm not good enough because there's a deeper insecurity in there. Yeah, this mindfulness about language is extremely important and it's, um, you know, getting back to when we talk, when we started our conversation, I think it was before the recorder went on, you said, you said something really interesting. You said to me, oh, I, I never was never really good at, at storytelling. I never saw myself as a storyteller, but like here I am telling stories. And, and actually, I want to just point out you are <laughs> because you are a storyteller and you're really good at it. It's just that this kind of story you're telling is how to be conscious about your storytelling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The storytelling creates reality. And the yeah. more emotion that you put with that story, the more power it has and the more it starts to manifest everything into being, you know, along that storyline. So I'm such a powerful spider woman myself. So I've had to learn how to, you know, I've, I've spun myself in many webs over time and up until now. And I've been in the process of learning how to spin webs that create beauty and, and prosperity and kindness and, and a higher consciousness. So th- those are the stories that I now choose to mm-hmm to spin and for the benefit of all. Well, and then trauma creates a narrative, which is why I combat the narrative. Trauma creates that, that perception of something happened to me and not for me. Um, And so I I reframe it. So it, it didn't happen to you. It happened for you. And it didn't happen to you specifically identity wise, right? It just, it happened. And we could just like, cut it off right there. It just, it happened. It happened, period. And what's, what's the story you're going to tell about it to give yourself more opportunity for everything you actually desire to occur, right? What are you going to manifest from this? Okay. So it happened. So what are we, what are we going to create? And this is the fun part. And this is where excitement comes in. This is where joy really comes in for my clients, because once they say, I can let go of the pain, what? Like, I don't have to suffer. I don't have to suffer. Like I could put down these thousand put like pound weights. Okay. So what's next? And, and sometimes there's a fear of the unknown, right? Because it's, it's chaos over here and chaos feels normal, but now we're shifting into a, okay, now I get to create it. Oh, I'm in control. What? I've never been in control before. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. And then, so I'll even like do art projects with my clients of like, okay, so just feel it. Like, what would it feel like if you had everything that you ever wanted in life? You know, what would, what, what kind of people would be in your life? How would you speak about yourself? And, um, you know, who's, what are you doing? Like place yourself there mentally because your your brain is so powerful that you can, because you make your own reality. And so you get creative and, and you start to feel those feelings that have been trapped underneath the negativity for ever. And then you start to become hopeful and then the wonder comes out and your soul goes back into your body and your body becomes safer. And then you really start to live life. And it's just sad to know that, you know, my trauma has taken almost 30, I'm 30, almost 33 right now, but um, almost 30 years to really, um, you know, just to move past that and really live and experience. And I was like, well, I can look at that as, as 30 years lost, or I can say this is 30 years of experience to put on a resume. (laughs) Well, there you go. I actually had somebody said to me that, um, that their sensei or their, you know, their master said that, um, 
anybody who comes into this life to be a guide for others, like a teacher, healer, um, guru, or whatever, you know, for other people, you've got to go through your own training ground on the mental body, the emotional body, and the physical body before you can be in service to other people. And that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, to, I could complain too, you know, 20 years in psychotherapy couch and then another 10 on my magical path, you know, like <laughs> experiencing like all of this cool stuff. Um, but yeah, like that's a long time to be sort of in this self inquiry, but, but then because you now, you know, it's like you made a map, like, you know, how to navigate that. And now you can be in service to others because you can see the signposts of where they might be and guide them. You know, and if you want to be a teacher, healer, guide, that's what you got to do. So for everybody listening, because I know so many of you listening to this podcast, that's who you are, because you wouldn't be tuned in to me if you weren't. You're here for the Great Awakening. Um, you're here for this. So just realize that, um, you know, all the struggle up until now, everything you, you think was a waste of time or, gosh, you know, it shouldn't be so, that's all the stuff that trained you, you know. So, like, it's your medicine bag to give to others. And, um yeah, beautiful. And if you want to work on this more with uh, with Haley, like if you just love Haley's energy, I mean, who doesn't? I dig it. I was even that was like, dang, I like I like Haley's loving energy. Um, she actually is offering a special for all of you in the Soul Nectar Show audience. That if you book with Haley for one to one coaching and use the promo code my name, Carrie, K-E-R-R-I, then you'll receive $100 off the Diamond Coaching Package. That's fantastic. So mm -hmm. uh, I will definitely put those links and information into the show notes so that you can um, get that special awesome deal. Is there anything else you want to share with the, the listeners at this time, Haley? Just be you and it's okay to be you. And you are uniquely you and there's no other person out there that has your DNA um, except for if you're an identical twin, but even then you still have different <laughs> fingerprints and that makes you amazing. It makes you special. It makes you loved. And thank you so much, Carrie, for what you're doing and the energy that you're putting out to the world. And you and I both have the same um, just goal of just to spread love, spread love, spread love, because there's a lot of pain that's being spread around as well and like anxiety and worry. And I just want to combat that. And so thank you so much for what you do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So, um, well, now it's down to you listeners and viewers. I'm going to ask you to like, share, and subscribe. That helps this podcast get reached by even more people. I want to celebrate that the last time I looked, we were, this podcast was a top 5% globally. That's fantastic. Can we all work together and get it up higher? Can we get it up to like a top 2% or where it shows up on like the top 10 podcasts on Apple or something like that. Let's just, you know, let's get this message out there. Let's really get it out there. Uh, appreciate your help. Uh, whatever you can do to do that, share it out or whatever. And in thanks in advance, we here come some kisses. Would you like to give kisses to everybody? We always, yeah. here we go. Mwah. Mwah. <laughs> we love you, everybody. We love you. <laughs> Have a beautiful week, everyone. And we'll see you next time on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now. If you found even one gold nugget in this episode of Soul Nectar Show, will you do us a favor? Will you subscribe, like, and share this episode? Maybe even write a comment and let us know what you thought about it. We really, really want to engage with you at a much deeper level. Let's be part of community together. Have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. To dive in deeper to nourishing conversation, visit soulnectar.show. Soul Nectar Show. Awaken the Soul Nectar Show. Take a sip from the drip of nectar from the source of who you are.